Okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this evening's YouTube live, to my live program today. Thank you very much for tuning in. If you're tuning in for the first time to Lamin Tamba is our Bantabakacha, or this channel is Lamin Tamba Bantabakacha, please uh, click the subscribe button and like our videos. We are Lamin Tamba Bantabakacha. Or the full name is Lamin Tambas Aus Bantabakacha. And we discuss mainly uh, community events, government issues, Pan Africanism activities happening in and around the Republic of the Gambia, predominantly. Sometimes we discuss issues ha happening in Senegal, in Guinea, Guinea Bissau, Mali, Burkina Faso all West African or African states, all right? So uh, if you're tuning in for the first time, this is Lamin Tamba's house, Bantaba Kacha. Uh, Bantaba simply means a gathering, open gathering usually of people uh, sitting down and chatting, talking about anything that comes to their mind. So we call it Bantaba. So the Bantaba is associated with discussions that happen in communities in and around the Gambia. So my channel is called Lamin Tambay's House Bantaba Kacha. If you're tuning in for the first time, please subscribe to the channel by clicking the subscribe button to Lamin Tambay's House Bantaba Kacha. Uh, also share the channel with people, share this live stream with people. This is the first time I'm doing a live stream on this channel. And I'm going to talk about Gambian issues. A lot of things that are happening in the Gambia right now, which we never expected to happen uh, in the Gambia, the Gambia they call New Gambia. So I want to discuss those things with my compatriots, Gambian uh, citizens. If you're not a Gambian citizen, but you're interested in activities in and around the Gambia, this program will interest you as well. If you don't have any activities or any interest in the Gambia, but you have got interest in the advancement of the African continent, you have got interest in advancing the Gambian course, or you like Africa in general, or you like humanity in general, this program will be for you. So share it, share it, share the program, subscribe uh, to the program, subscribe to the channel, share the program. Uh, if you do want to come back again, this channel will have regular content provided to you and it'll be mainly issues talking about the Gambia and Senegal. Reason why we talk about Senegal as often as we do about the Gambia is because Senegal and the Gambia are the same culturally. We were the same country, the same region uh, from time immemorial. It's the colonial masters who came and divided us into Gambia being an English colony and Senegal being a French colony. But culturally, language-wise, practices, norms, values, traditions, are exactly the same. The dialects might differ depending on which side of the Gambia you come from or depending on which side of Senegal you come from. But our practices, our culture, everything is exactly the same. So if you go to Gambia and you speak to a Gambian person who is an indigene of the Republic of the Gambia, an indigene of Senegal, the chances are they'll speak one or two or three other languages from Gambia or Senegal, all right? So today we're talking about the Republic of the Gambia, which has a so-called president. We have a president. Uh, he is president by name. He is president by title. We give him respect for the fact that he is the current title holder of the post of president of the Republic of the Gambia. And that president, if you're not familiar with Gambian politics, is called Adam Abaro. And he has been president of the Republic of the Gambia since uh, February, or we can say for the sake of political correctness, he was president of the Republic of the Gambia since 19th of January 2017, when he was sworn in on foreign soil illegally. To be precise, he was sworn in in Senegal as the president of the Gambia because he was living in exile in Senegal because they gave him the fear that him staying in the Republic of the Gambia was not good for his security and that of his supporters. I think that fear is unfounded. It didn't exist. 
there was no fear that Alma Baro or his supporters were going to lose their lives because they've been in Gambia throughout the tenure of President Jame when he was in power. So Gambia had a president called Yaya Jame, who ruled as a military chairman of the Armed Forces Provisional Ruling Council from 1994 July to January 1996. Then he transformed himself or the people forced him to change to a civilian president who contested the elections and won in 1996. So he was sworn in or his office officially started in January 1996. So he left office in January 2017 and Adam Obaro assumed him and since then it's been a tragedy after another in the Republic of the Gambia and this is no exaggeration. I'm not exaggerating it. Gambia is a sad case of a country that was a probable nation, progressing nicely, very secure, very safe, uh, promising to both youth and women, promising to everyone from all sectors, all regions of the Gambia, the country was ticking along. Maybe not developing rapidly as we've seen some other countries develop quite significantly over the 20 years that President Yama was a leader in the Gambia. But then if you look at other countries too, they have resources that Gambia didn't have. Those countries are bigger than the Gambia. Those countries have had to deal with issues that we didn't have to deal with. And we had issues that we dealt with that we didn't have to deal with. So either way, President Jama was the president of the Republic of the Gambia. Until he left in January, Adam Barrow took over. When Adam Barrow took over government in 2017, he promised the Gambian population and his supporters in the diaspora, a lot of uh, projects that he was going to implement in the Gambia. One key project that he mentioned in April 2017 that he was going to make history was energy supply to the Republic of the Gambia. He said uh, he was going to transform the energy sector of Gambia to a point where the power cuts, the blackouts that Gambian people were suffering from under President Jame, his predecessor, those power outages will be history. Adam Baro promised to transform the energy sector of the Gambia to an admirable one, one that we've never seen before. It will be so much better than what President Yama was offering to the Gambian people. That's All right. But then we found out that this guy, Adam Baro, is all about talk. He's got no substance. We quickly found out that the guy was not actually well informed academically, not informed politically. His geopolitics was terrible. His background as a potential president of the Republic of the Gambia quickly got found out. And he, Adam Obaro himself admitted that he was not cut out for that position. He didn't have much going for him when he took over the post of the presidency. Yes, nobody was born to become a president. Majority of people will, will go into the presidency as their first time going into the office of president. Not many people return as presidents after they've left office. So we expect some rough landings sometimes. When we expected Adam Barrow with his poor academic background, poor background in the civil service, maybe not even any background, not even a single a quarter of experience in the civil service. If I remember correctly, Adam Bora never worked in the civil service, so he didn't have the ethos. The work ethic is not there. The technical know-how wasn't there. The attitude, this, the, the, um, basically the presentation of a civil servant he didn't have when he went into government. So he was what you call rough on the edges or rough all round, inside and out. He's more than just rough edges. So it's basically, he was a gem, so to speak, that was found in the rough. And he was supposed to be smoother in time. Well, it turned out Adam Abaro was actually fool's gold, that he was never going to improve in time. No matter how you polished this gem, that promising gem, no matter how much you polished it, no matter how much you refined it, no matter how much resources you put into turning this promising rock that you found in the quarry, 
it never turned into any solid metal. It absolutely never changed. Atma Baro never improved. He gets increasingly worse, actually, which is why it's absolutely scary as a Gambian citizen, as a lover of the Republic of the Gambia, as somebody who's concerned by the direction that my country is taking, that despite the enormous resources that Adma Barrow had to start with, unlike President Yame, who started his presidency with travel advice, with sanctions, with all sorts of obstacles that the Western governments put on him because he overthrew the government that was there on the 22nd of July, 1994. So the Western states didn't want unconstitutional change of government. So they say, uh, we've now found out that that is not actually true, that true democracy didn't even exist even in Western states, European states, American uh, democracy was fraught with election uh, uh, fraud and several other irregularities. But that's not the purpose of my conversation today. My conversation today is about the Republic of the Gambia. And I want to discuss how Adam Abaro, after all that promise, that rock that we saw in the quarry, we picked up, oh, that's a, that's a gem, rough on the edges. We'll get better. This was actually not a solid rock. It's not good material. It had no minerals in it. It was all chaff, no minerals. And by now, so Adam Barrow came in January 2017, even though President Jame left the shores of the Republic of the Gambia, Adam Barrow was still afraid to return to the Gambia one week later. He had to be pushed out of Senegal or pressured into returning to the Gambia after being sworn on foreign soil illegally because the Gambian constitution has no mandate for swearing president elects on foreign soil. But they did swear him again when he returned to the Gambia on the 18th of February, 2017, which was Gambia's independence day. So in my view, his presidency actually effectively started on the 18th of February, 2017, when he returned to the Republic of the Gambia. All right. So anyway, all those uh, things out of the way, we want to go to the fact that today, as we speak in the Republic of the Gambia, we have a president who doesn't talk about the issues, the bread and butter issues that affect Gambian people. Again, this takes me back to my foundation I laid of this rough gem, this guy that we thought was rough on the edges, that there's so much promise that this guy will deliver. Adam Baro will give us what he said would be uh, electricity, stable electricity, adequate and stable electricity. He didn't deliver. He will give us solid and fast Wi-Fi or internet broadband. And you remember the problem he had with the former finance minister, Mr. Amar Sane, who paid about $75 million or similar for the Gambian broadband internet services to be upgraded. Now that loan and the circus that went around it uh, eventually led to the dismissal of the former finance minister, or it led to so many disagreements within the government. And that agreement of signing $75 million loan to upgrade Gambia's internet service without informing the then Minister of Communications, D.A. Jao, if you can remember very well, it caused a lot of hoo-ha in Adam Obaro's government. In many ways, that was symptomatic. That is something we came to live with. We saw it regularly where Adam Obaro's officials bicker and defer and come up with different opinion publicly on government principle. You think they'll consult each other on the ground internally and then come up with a statement when they agree on something and it's been approved. No. Anwar Baro's government has been punctuated consistently by uh, bickerings, public fallouts, public contradictions. The latest of them was in the shooting uh, dead of two of our paramilitary officers, police intervention unit officers, and the grave wounding of a third. Now, that was the latest example of how Barrow government is effectively contradicting each other consistently along the way and confusing the Gambian public. Because today, no Gambian citizen 
actually thinks that Adam Abaro and his government are delivering uh, up to expectation. We're not delivering up to expectation. Gambia is basically falling to pieces. I'll come to that in a minute. All right. I'm just making people because this is the first time I'm doing a live stream on Lamin Tamba is the house Bantabaka Cha. If you're tuning in for the first time, Bantabaka Cha means uh, a public gathering, the conversations and the discussions that people have. Bantaba is uh, usually associated with open gatherings, uh, which are very common in the Gambia culturally. We gather around a tree, under a tree or somewhere there's a bench or maybe uh, a superstructure erected somewhere where people just go and camp when they've got nothing serious going on or when they have village meetings or town meetings so they can sit there and have chats. The chats could be casual, could be serious village meetings, could be serious town meetings. But Bantaba is a gathering, uh, a place of gathering for Gambian people, Senegalese, Guinea that sub-region that has a lot of cultures that um, are alike. Kacha means chat, discussion, let's chat, or right, means kacha. So my channel, this channel is called Lamin Tamba Saos Bantaba Kacha. Now, as I said before, since Adam Baro came in, there's been one promise after another that he was going to transform the Republic of the Gambia. He was going to build the bridge between Banjul and Bara, the long-awaited bridge between Banjul and Bara. And he was going to do that quickly. He was going to build 60 mosques. He was going to provide free Wi-Fi for Brikama. He was going to um, build loads of hospitals in Sierra. Uh, if I remember correctly, he said he was going to build 50. It turned out this guy didn't actually know what he was talking about. He had no clue what was going on. Admittedly, he said publicly that he was not cut out for the position. He didn't have the experience. He didn't have the technical know-how. He didn't have the academic grounding to be able to run the state. But he had a team of technocrats who were going to help him. That's why he said, little did we know that actually he didn't have that many technocrats uh, crats who could help him. And sometimes it, it, it comes across as if no matter how brilliant you are, no matter how patriotic you are, working for Adam Abaro and hoping that you can transform him, it's bordering on fantasy rather than reality. All right, because I don't know the people who advise Adam Abaro and work closely to him. I don't know how they cope with his constant uh, display of a lack of care for the issues that are affecting Gambian public right now. And those issues are rampant. They're widespread. You can't look at Adam Abaro's government and think one sector in his government yeah, is excelling. You can't. That's none of the government sectors that's excelling right now. They're all failing consistently to a point where government departments can no longer pay their electricity bills and have to remain closed or operate during the day without electricity where they cannot operate their computers. They cannot uh, renew your Wi-Fi uh, broadband uh, contract because most of the branches are closed they couldn't pay their electricity bill or you go to government depart departments like the ministry of justice and they couldn't process your certificate business certificate they couldn't regi register your company because they were unable to pay gamtel gambia telecommunications company their wi-fi bill or they couldn't pay the national water and electricity company their electricity bill this is what's happening in the Gambia. This is no joke. Now, if you're not in the Gambia, you think, uh, is this guy lying or something? No, I'm serious. I'm not lying. I'm not telling tales, guys. This is real. This is happening in Gambia in real time. Government departments that were once profitable, very viable, can no longer pay for their electricity bills, can no longer pay their internet bills. It got to a point where the Ministry of Justice and other departments had to be disconnected from the grid electricity grid for non-payment of bills and some government departments have been disconnected from the internet connectivity because they couldn't pay bills i'm not making this up this is happening as of last week several gamtel branches all right were closed because they couldn't afford to pay electricity bills and therefore some of my family members and friends who went to renew their wi-fi monthly wi-fi uh payments to have Wi-Fi in their properties. They couldn't pay 
in several branches they went to the branches were closed they had to go from all the way from Seraconda, Brufood, uh, Bruce B Estate, Jabang, to Banjul to be able to pay and get their internet services continuing or reinstate their internet services. That's how bad things have become in the Republic of the Gambia. Yeah? So, uh, look, it's some of the stuff that's happening in borough government, it, it's, it's, it's laughable. Uh, you wouldn't expect a government to get to this point. No, you wouldn't expect the government to get to this point. It's it's ridiculous. All right. But anyway, we knew from 27 people like me after listening to Adam Barrow's interviews in 2017, I listened to one. I said, oh, OK, let me listen to a second one because that first one was really poor. I listened to the second one. It didn't get better. I listened to the third one. It got worse. And like, oh, damn, we've got our work cut out as a country. I mean, sometimes change is good. Sometimes it's good. But sometimes change can be a very big issue, depending on who you've changed from and who you changed matters to. Now, the biggest mistake is uh, Gambians voted in 2016. I wasn't involved in Gambian politics before impasse 2016. I got involved in Gambian politics in impasse 2016 because of a lot of stuff that was being written and said and shared and and spoken about everywhere so i thought hang on my country is on the brink of civil war maybe my input will help calm people down and steady the nation so if i had few other people who reason and want to calm down the tension that was going on in our communities and in our society we might as well avoid uh, an impending disaster so that's what got me involved in Gambian politics. And then I started carrying out research into who is who, what was what, what was done in the Gambia, and I got involved in Gambian politics. But anyway, fast forward to April 2017, when Alma Barrow started promising people heaven and he started delivering hell. Now, the signs are there for me from the beginning that Alma Barrow was not going to be a patriot. He was not going to sacrifice for the Republic of the Gambia. He didn't come to work his socks off to sacrifice for the Republic of the Gambia to take us from where President Yama left us to the next level. I knew that from the beginning, all right? And the signs started coming out when straight away, a very poor Adam Abaro, who had nothing before he became president, suddenly sent his student to universities or colleges in the United States. That was April 2017 just four or five months into his presidency, Adam Oboro started building himself a mansion in his village called Manka Mankonda. Now, the alarm bells started ringing for me. The alarm bells cautioned raised by me that the change that we had in the Gambia was a disaster. It was a catastrophe. But the alarm bells actually started ringing when I saw Adam Oboro serving himself. Instead of sacrificing, because if you said President Yama was that bad, he was he was corrupt. He was a monster. All the accusations that you guys leveled at the uh, gentleman, President Jame, if he said he was that bad, President Jame, for all of the allegations that they leveled against him, didn't send his children or his nieces. He didn't do that. In fact, before he started building his house at the village, he was already in office for about 10 to 15 years. All right, before he started constructing his proper house in Kanilai, his President Yama's village. That's how you sacrifice for your people. You serve the people first, and then you benefit from it in the long run. Either through your hard work, your salary, your investments, or the people that you've lifted from nowhere to somewhere will turn around and come back and say, Hey, President Yama, I come from the village. I was born and bred in a hut. Because of you, I had the opportunity to be able to get to where I am today. All right. So therefore, I've come back to give you this as a vote of thanks or as a mark of thank you for what you've done for me and the Republic of the Gambia. And that's until this day, six, we're running up to seven years since President Jame left. President Jame, if you compare him to Adam Abaro, is becoming increasingly popular, more popular by the day compared to Adam Abaro. If the two of them have to contest elections again today in the Republic of the Gambia, 
President Jame will thump Adam Abaro to non-existence. He'll thump him. He'll flatten him. Nobody's going to know which insane person, deluded person, gave Adam Abaro the vote, actually. President Jame will annihilate him. Total annihilation. Even Baro himself asked the question, why do people still like President Yame and they're devoted to him and they're loyal to him? But my own people in Jamara constituency, he can't say constituency, by the way. Gambian president can't say constituency. He says consequency. <laughs> Again, that demonstrates the man's lack of uh, academic grounding, which is not a bad thing. You don't have to go to a Western school education for you to be smart. I've seen Gambian people who've done very well in business, very smart people, gifted people, who didn't sit in any formal Western education. Any of the classrooms educated people in accordance with Western education. But they're very smart. They care about the people. They have sympathy. Every time they come up to the public, they've got empathy. These people are saving lives in the Republic of the Gambia. Not the president of the republic. I've never heard Adam Aboro for the last three years sit down and comprehensively decipher some of the issues that are plaguing the Republic of the Gambia. He never does that. Every time this guy comes and stands on stage, most of the time all he does is uh, basically trust talking his opponents talking a lot of rubbish. What you actually get at a banter bar where people got nothing significant to talk about they just turn it into uh, uh, a gossip mill rampant fantasies they talk about anything that comes to their imagination that's what the current president of the Gambia does never sits down one day with the media in fact he runs away from press conferences since he got humiliated a few years ago in a press conference where they asked him questions and he totally blinded everyone including his advisors, he stopped doing the press conferences because initially he was going to have press conferences once a month organized by his press officer at State House. Then the first one went clangers. <laughs> it was bonkers. <laughs> Second one went absolutely crazy. And then they scrapped the press conference. So now you can interview him so that he can talk absolute rubbish, talk about anything he wants. And even that, when he's in a relaxed environment so that he can talk about his own issues freely, he barely talks about, okay, we've got problems with the energy sector. Electricity is an issue. So therefore, my government, with the Minister of, Minister of Energy, are putting XYZ in place to be able to alleviate the suffering that Gambian people and businesses are suffering from due to the shortage of electricity. He never does that. Adam Baro doesn't do that. He never talks about stuff like that. He doesn't even have a clue. When the media, on rare occasions, when they say to him, oh, uh, do you know that we're losing a lot of electricity? There's no electricity in Bundung, no electricity in Sinchu, no electricity in Malingara. He'll say, well, electricity is better now than what it was under President Yame. Because under President Yame, we're losing, we're having power cuts for between 17 to 19 times a day. Something that's not actually true. But that's the kind of realm that Adam Baro excels in. Fantasy. Delusion. He can talk about stuff that doesn't exist all day long. And he can talk about the most heinous of crimes that anyone can commit. Any human being can commit. All right? He basically says stuff as if he forgets that he's actually the head of state. Supposed to be the president of the Republic of the Gambia. He never sits down and says, okay, I know there is a, an issue with water supply in this country. So therefore, my government is putting plan X, Y, Z to be able to counter the issue of inadequate water supply, especially for rural communities like Sandu, where some of the boreholes or the wells they dug are several hundred or several meters deep and people struggle to be able to get water out of their wells. He never says, okay, I'm going to go to Sandu and drill some boreholes for my people so that they'll be able to get clean, reliable, and safe drinking water. Never does that. Never sits down on a regular basis based on the problems that Gambians are suffering from. 
So that's energy crisis right now. That's water crisis right now. That's medical crisis right now because the main hospital in the Gambia has got only one ambulance. But I'll come to that in a minute. All right, because I'm going to talk about uh, ambulances that they bought with COVID-19 money and where those ambulances went. It'll be interesting to know where Adam Aboro and his people put our ambulances. Did they convert them into something else? I'll come to that in a minute. All right. Anyway, so we go back. You would think as a head of state, he'll come one day and say, all right, well, I'm going to I'm going to actually talk about the problems we're facing right now with our education sector. Now, teachers are not being paid regularly. They're not being paid on time. Uh, our teachers are not being trained in the numbers that can sustain the shortage of uh, staff in the teaching industry. Because what they've done now with Adam Abaro, Gambia College, which used to be the teacher training college in the Gambia, is now having to charge students to learn to become teachers and go back and teach in our nursery schools, our primary schools, our secondary schools, and other institutions. It used to be free. Not only was it free for teachers to learn to teach other people, but they give you monthly stipends that helped you in terms of your transport, or food, or clothing, or buying stationery. When Adam Barrow's government came, two, three years later, that luxury of having a stipend disappeared. And then they turned Gambia College, which used to be free, into a fee-paying institution. And the majority of people, especially in the teaching field, which is one of the poorest paid industries in the Gambia, people cannot then afford to pay $14,000 per annum to learn to teach. And when you finish, you can't even post it to a school to go and teach. Some of the allowances that they give to newly qualified teachers started disappearing way back in 2019. They were not paying teachers. Teachers got stranded. There were endless teacher strikes since Adam Barrow came to power. And that's not because there is new democracy in Gambia. No, there's no new democracy in the Gambia because Adam Barrow's government has actually clamped down on more protests than the government of President Jame did in its entire 20 years. All right? So, 22 years, actually. So, Adam Barrow and his government are refusing permits for people to have political events, to have community events. Uh, but we'll go, we go to that in a minute. Uh, I'm just going to elaborate on why uh, we're in this mess today. Now, the tourism industry, Adam Barrow will not come and talk to us about why the tourism industry in the Gambia has effectively died. He'll rather go and stand up on stage and talk about how... Uh, his former godfather, political godfather, I don't think he still calls him political godfather anymore, Usain Odabo, how he was unable to pay taxes and only had to pay taxes during election year so that he can contest for the position of president. Now, whether that's true or not, it's up to Adam Abaro and his people to sort that out. But to use that as a conversation when you're meeting farmers, you're meeting fishermen, you're meeting people in the countryside instead of talking to them about the deplorable security situation where we are because people are doing cattle rustling rampantly in the countryside people are being killed by senegalese forces rampantly by the countryside senegalese army and other security forces are violating our territory on a regular basis shooting gambian citizens killing them in the phonies shooting gambian citizens in CRR, shooting gambian citizens in urr doing what they want on, on Gambian soil with impunity. Instead of Adam Barrow talking to these farmers about those things and how he's going to make their agriculture better after seizing their tractors and mechanized farming, mechanized tools, all right? Adam Barrow's government seized mechani uh, uh, mechanized, basically they, they stifled mechanized agriculture back in 2017 by seizing tractors across the country. And these tractors were helping in terms of producing the goods that were locally consumed in the Republic of the Gambia. Again, that explains why, as soon as Barrow came to power, the prices of commodities skyrocketed. They would like to bl blame COVID-19 and blame uh, the special military operation in Ukraine launched by Russia. No, 
Adam Abaro's government started having issues with uh, price control way back in 2018. The price started going through the roof. The prices of everything skyrocketed. And by 2019, we actually started suffering from inflation. And the IMF warned the government of Adam Abaro in 2019 that you're getting close to your borrowing ceiling. And therefore, you need to introduce some physical discipline in your government in order to be able to stabilize the market, stabilize your government, to reduce your uh, uh, borrowing and to be able to handle your external and internal debt. The IMF did that in November, October, November 2019. That was before coronavirus came. That was before Russia's special military operation in Ukraine. So therefore, Baru and his people cannot turn around and say, oh, the prices of commodities went up. No. Coronavirus and uh, the conflict in Ukraine just made matters worse like they did in many other countries. But Adam Barrow's fall actually started before those two significant events. To compare Barrow with President Jame, under President Jame in um, 1994, President Jame came in when Gambia was in austerity, imposed by the IMF. All right, austerity. It was called the Economic Recovery Recovery Program because the PPP government went into total depression in the late 80s, mid 80s, late 80s, and that uh, government had to agree an austerity plan with uh, foreign creditors. So when President Jame came, the Gambia government was actually on its knees financially. Uh, a young army lieutenant at that time didn't mind. They set about changing the socio-economic status of the Republic of the Gambia. Despite that economic recovery program, despite the travel advice and sanctions, the young army officers succeeded in turning Gambia to a point where people just said to President Yame, what you've done in two years is remarkable. So therefore, we want you to be able to continue, resign from the army and contest as a civilian president. I won't give you a vote. They did give him his vote. He won. He became a formal president from January 1996 to January 2017. But Adam Abaro, unfortunately, doesn't talk about the bread and butter issues in the Republic of the Gambia. So he's on holiday now. He had visits from various communities who've got various problems. Key amongst those problems is security situation, medical situation, education, energy crisis, water crisis, agricultural crisis, fishing industry crisis. Which industry is excelling on the Adam Barrow? None. And it gets worse because when people know that they've got a head of state who's actually deranged, who's totally lost it, like Adam Barrow, people do ridiculous things to a point where last weekend we saw somebody go and bring a dead and decomposed hippopotamus, all right? And, and gave it as a gift to the president of the Gambia. Now, if I was Gambian head of state, let's suppose I was a head of state in the Gambia, and somebody says to me, I've got a gift for you. And I said, mm, okay, what gift would that be? And they said, oh, I got a hippopotamus that I can go and kill and present to you as a gift. I think I'm going to hippos. I've heard stories about people eating hippos when I was young. However, People don't eat them anymore. The hippos are protected animals now in the Gambia. So legally, you didn't go and kill a hippo and give it to me as a present because you'll be breaking the law. Secondly, I'm not going to eat a hippo. So you'll be giving me a present that probably is not worth my what. So that's the situation we're in. But I know about all, of all people. I don't even know. I've got so many stories uh, about that hippo including stories from traditional people as to why he was gifted a hippo, all right? But all these things are speculation. Some people have said it was a ritual. They might have uh, watered that hippo until it died with spiritual uh, water and all that. Not. Some people said they brought it to him so that they can use it for rituals. Is it true or not? I can't prove those things. So as a science student and a lover of science are as to what can be proven 
And what can be proven is that hippos, hippopotamus, uh, is a protected species of animals in the Gambia. You cannot kill them just because you want to. You cannot kill them but just because you want to uh, benefit from it politically. Opportunism. You should only shoot and kill a hippo in the Gambia or any other endangered species when the animal or the species are endangering human life or livelihoods. That's the only time you're allowed to put them down for the safety of human beings or the livelihoods of human beings. You don't kill a hippo to present it as a gift to the president, let alone a dead and decomposed hippo. What was Adam Baro going to do with that uh, hippo that they gave to him? Was he going to eat it? Was he going to share the meat with his people? What did he get out of it? What did he do with the ch gentleman of all the people? The gentleman decided, okay, I'm going to bring a dead and decomposing hippo to give it to the Gambian president as a gift. I mean, seriously, what is wrong with Adam Baru and his advisors? Do they have problems or something? They got something, problems thinking, because at first I thought, okay, he didn't go to school that much, probably flunked all his exams in high school. The guy didn't even have a proper job before in, a, in an organized institution. Fair enough, you can do business and be successful and run a business effectively, employ several other people. He didn't even have that. He was just a letting, lettings agent. I'm not sure he had many employees. If he had any employees, it would be less than 10. All right? The guy was a, a poor church mouse. Maybe not as poor as the average Gambian uh, at the time, but he wasn't wealthy. Certainly not wealthy. Right. So if you're not smart academically, you're not smart institutionally or via experience, and your thinking capacity is actually not at a level of running a unit, let alone a section, let alone running a department, or an entire institution, or running the whole nation, what do you think is going to happen to the Republic of the Gambia? It's the exact disaster that we're facing right now. Where somebody turns up and says, oh, Mr. President, I'm going to give you a hippo as a, as a gift. The first thing that comes to my mind would be, why a hippo? Why can't you just go and get chicken for me or fish? Because I like fish. Lamin Tamba likes fish. Just go and get fish for me. I'll be more than happy. Why hippo? How, what can I do with a hippo? If I eat one hoof of a hippo, I'll be full for a week. And the rest of the meat will deco decompose. Unless I give it to people. Do people actually he eat hippos anymore? Of all the things, of all the gifts. Look, go to your farm in Manka Mankunda. Get me some raw, fresh peanuts. Just pull it out of the ground and bring it for me. I'll be the happiest person on the planet. You don't have to go and kill a hippo. Present it to me so that you can benefit from the political uh, activities that go with it. Because sometimes people do that just to be, be close to the president. To be recognized sometimes when they present those sort of gifts to the president they get a word of cash given to them or the local community will say oh he gave that to the president or the president knows him or here and there just for self-aggrandizement nothing else all right but as a head of state you need to think carefully if one of my advisors came to me and said oh somebody wants to gift you an elephant or a rhino or they got the tusk of an elephant or the 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 horn of a rhino for you as a gift i'll be thinking hang on i last time i checked no one was supposed to kill those game animals go to game parks all right kill those animals and use them as trophies this is where education comes in and education as i said before doesn't have to be academic it can be via experienced experience it could be street wisdom Sadly, we have somebody carrying the title of president in the Gambia who doesn't have the academic uh, acumen, doesn't have street wisdom, and doesn't have the experience. But we expect this person to come and bring about meaningful change in our republic. It doesn't work like that. And the post of presidency is a fast learning position. As I said at the beginning of this program, nobody was born to be a president. For most people who go into the office of president, that will be the first time they're going into the office of president. So therefore, cooling of period is allowed. Time for you to adapt is allowed. But you will 
been noticeably improving over time. Well, with Adam Abaro, it's the actual opposite because when he came newly, he was a bit humble, pretending to be humble. He was careful. He pretended to care. He pretended to know what was happening to Gambian people. But that was a facade that was he was projecting to the people. It was a facade, pretending to the people that he was humble, uh, that he was prepared to listen to people, he was prepared to help the Republic of the Gambia. As soon as he set his roots expanding in the office of president, instead of the noticeable improvement in his speech, in the manner in which he carries himself, you would see a president that's excelling with the panache, the pomp, and ceremony that goes with it. No. This guy can't even have a proper party. He doesn't even know how to do things. Maybe he thought that baby hippo that they killed and gave him was an opportunity to have a big party at the weekend and eat the hippo, have a grill with his mates because he loves his food. I don't know how Mbahali a hippo or chewy hippo tasted. All right? The stew, hippo stew or the hippo grill or the hippo Mbahali. I don't know how it tasted. If any of you were in Mankamankunda and you had a taste of that hippo, <laughs> please let me know the delicacy, the texture of the meat. From what I saw, no one should eat it. As I posted before, I worry about President Barrow's health and his mate's health if they ate that decomposing hippo. It was absolutely ridiculous. But I don't know if they ate it or not. If they ate it, I would love to know how the meat tasted. Uh, because it was absolutely disgusting seeing what we saw last weekend that they were killing hippos just to appease the president of the Gambia for self-aggrandizement or for political opportunism. Nothing but that. You go and kill an endangered species. You know what? For all you know, that hippo actually died. It might have died from a heart attack. Who knows? <laughs> or the hippo might have been stranded somewhere because they do get stranded, these hippos. Sometimes they get stranded somewhere and they can't move because the legs are very short so if it goes somewhere that's not paddy or muddy all right the place doesn't have moisture it can actually get stranded very quickly if it falls in a hole that's not soft so that it can climb itself out so if it falls in a ditch that is quite dry it can't lift itself out so it probably got into a situation like that because i didn't see any bullet marks or any marks of bow arrows on the hippo all right maybe that's how they killed it but the mark, the only one mark I saw on it was not enough to kill a hippo. That bow arrow, if it's a bow arrow alone, it's not going to kill it at that point. If it's a bullet, it was just by the shoulder, front leg of the shoulder. Uh, front leg or the shoulder. That didn't look like a bullet wound to me. It didn't look like a bow and arrow pierced it at that point either. So therefore, for all you know, that hippo was stranded somewhere. This particular individual who thought, all right, I seen a dead hippo here. I can claim that I killed it and gifted it to the president. I might just get a few thousand um, uh, dollars for uh, appearing to be that big, glorious hunter. Uh, because hunters always glorify their stories. They'll never tell you how a hyena chased them in the bushes <laughs> and they ran and climbed up the trees. Hunters will always glorify that, their side of the story as to how they fought a python and killed it as to how they fought a lion and killed it, even though when they killed the lion, the lion was sleeping and they went there and shot it and killed it. But who was there to say it? In our own local proverb in Gambia, they said lying is always good and convenient when he's sitting by the riverbank. Because you can tell people you just saw a barracuda jump up and go in the water. And then when say, oh, where is it? He said, well, you just jump back in the water. You guys are too late. That's how it's convenient to lie by the riverbank. <laughs> all right so the hunter for all you know the hippo got stranded somewhere it couldn't lift itself out of the hole probably suffocated there hippos need water to dehydrate not dehydrate to rehydrate rather yeah so it probably got dehydrated died in that hole somebody saw it opportunism said oh this will actually be a very good idea to say to the president that i killed the hippo and i'm giving, gonna give it to him as a gift because they knew Adam Abaro was in the countryside on his holiday. All right. So I've heard so many stories about it. However, if the president of the Gambia was a well-informed person, he would have said, okay, don't give that to me as a gift because uh, it 
actually is a crime to kill hippos. Did you kill it? Yeah. Where's the sign of killing it? I'll send the forces to come and have a look. Send your security forces or the police to go and have a look or wildlife conservation to go and have a look. Probably died by itself. If you shot it and killed it, so then why did you kill it? All right, it endangered somebody. That's why I kill it. But now that I've killed it, it's big meat. I'll present it to you as the president as a gift from me. Uh, but that I don't think happened. Uh, we don't know yet. Uh, we need to know who the hunter is and maybe have a proper interview with him. Find out what actually happened. Yes, come in. Are you going to bed? Oh, What's going on? No, I think going back. Oh. All right. I'm live here. All right, sorry about that. So, we, we don't know. But again, this is why it's good to have very educated presidents in office because they just don't jump and do things. Even if they, they're transported that hippo as they did uh, to the president's palace, you, you don't have to come out and come and look at it at the hippo. Somebody's brought it as a gift. Yeah, cool. Fine. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, you know what? I don't fancy hippos. So therefore, I'm not going to leave what I'm doing to come and look at a hippo. If it's a live one, yeah. Of course, I'd love to see a live hippo up and close. Yeah, I've seen them several times. Growing up, I've seen them, live ones. Uh, and I've seen them in zoos as well. So for me, it's not a novelty anymore. But I'd like to see one again. I love wildlife. So that's why the cruelty that went with the killing of that hippo, endangered species, protected species, so that somebody can benefit from political posturing. I found it absolutely absurd. And the president of the Gambia seemed to endorse that level of cruelty. Because if you accepted it and you went out to inspect it and you looked happy, that meant you were aiding or abetting or aiding and abetting a criminal offence. But again, did Baru know? No. Maybe he didn't know it was a protected species. Maybe he knew. Because Barrow himself breaks the laws. We saw during COVID when the laws were no public gatherings. Barrow and his wife went to Mankamankunda to have a birthday party. And when they got caught, they looked like, oh, we don't care because we're, I, am the, I am the head of state's wife, so I can go and have a party in Mankamankunda. Barrow's government is the most corrupt thing we've had in the Gambia's history, recent history. The most corrupt thing you'll ever see. Barrow is not doing anything. The other day I heard him pronouncing, or his people said, he said he's now going to clamp down on corruption. How many times did he say that? What happened to the energy sector? Our energy sector is completely dependent on Senegal and car power now. We don't have our grid. Our own grid is now decimated, totally destroyed, not working properly. We are entirely dependent on Senegal for energy supply. And without energy supply, we can't have water. So therefore, if we have conflict with Senegal, as it is happening now, because Senegal is trying to claim some of the Gambian territory around Combo South, Combo Central, Dasilame and they want some of that territory for themselves. That's what Senegal is trying to do. If we have conflict, as it's happening between Israel and Palestine, Senegal can just turn around and say, oh, okay, well, we're going to switch off all your electricity supply to the Republic of the Gambia. We will not have electricity supply. And for weeks, we will not have water supply because without electricity, you can't pump pipe more water to people's households and businesses. So we're absolutely stuffed. This is what I was crying about in 2017, that Senegal's actually installing a governor in Gambia. There are 11 provinces. That if we allow Adam Abaro to run away with this, Senegal is going to capitalize on all our industries that give us our sovereign wealth. That's where we are today, ladies and gentlemen. Our cashew industry, 30 million euros a year. That was the first thing Senegal hijacked. Our airline industry and tourism industry, Senegal is hijacking. Our Dubai port, deep port, Senegal is hijacking. Our airport, Senegal is trying to hijack. Senegal has hijacked our security sector. Senegal's hijacked our fishing sector. Senegal's actually provide Adama Barrow's bodyguards so they know every single thing that happened in Gambia, that happens in Gambia State House. The two bodyguards, close protection officers for Adama Barrow are Senegalese. So therefore, whichever bedroom he sleeps in at night, because he's got two wives, if he goes to the first wife, Senegal knows, oh, today he's sleeping with the first wife. Oh, uh, well, no, not sleeping, so that's a bit rude. 
he's going to sleep in the first wife's room. If he goes to the second wife's room, Senegal knows, oh, today he's going to sleep in the second wife's room. That's the situation where that Senegal knows every single thing that's happening in the Gambia before we even get to know it. That's why I said he's basically clothed himself in the title of presidency, but we don't have a president. Arab person, a president has been installed in, Senegal, in Gambia by Senegal. So we're Senegal's 11th province. He, therefore, he's a governor of the Republic of Senegal because he's running Gambia in the interest of Senegal and France. Because whatever you do to Senegal now, in terms of uh, uh, benefits, all right, in terms of uh, positive outcome for Senegal, it goes to France by extension. That's where we are. That's where our country is at right now, ladies and gentlemen. We are producing the raw materials, the good. Our sovereign wealth is going to Senegal, and whatever goes to Senegal ends up in France because Senegal reserves their foreign. Uh, uh, wealth in France and France tells them when they can and cannot have it and France benefits from it four to eight hundred billion euros a year France is benefiting from people like us in the Gambia yet our main hospital in the Gambia has one ambulance you go and look at hospitals in France look at the roads in France look at the electricity supply in France look at the facilities public infrastructure in France it's tip top brand spanking top fungling in infrastructure they got in, in, in France. But we're struggling to have more than one ambulance at our flagship hospital. Our main referral hospital has got one ambulance, ladies and gentlemen. Not even paracetamol is given to patients anymore in these hospitals. They can't even have bed sheets in our main referral hospital, ladies and gentlemen. This is no joke. Carry out spot visits to the Royal Victoria Hospital, now called the Edward Francis Small Teaching Hospital. Carry out spot visits, not even bed sheets. We just saw a few days ago, Bassa Hospital, three patients sharing one bed. You go to a hospital to get one ailment cured and you leave hospital with two, three other ailments that you might have picked up from other patients. We call this a country? Is this the republic that we wanted, the change that we wanted? Is this what we call Gambia has decided? Is this why we wanted President Jame out? So that we can go deeper into this abyss, deep dark abyss that we found ourselves. Because under President Jame, despite Ebola, despite two crop failures within a short space of time, despite the struggles that he had, Gambia never got down this deep, dark, perilous path. Now, we're tittering on the brink. We're hovering precariously on that balance. And the balance, the scales, only takes a fly, a tiny little light fly, to land on the wrong side of the scale, and Gambia will be in a total economic decadence. That's where we are now, ladies and gentlemen. That's where we are now. Our Gambian courthouses were supposed to be straight. They were supposed to be the, the, the administrators of uh, the law. Being a deterrent, handing out adequate sentences to people who robbed the public purse. But we've seen exhibits at our courthouses and safes with money in them going missing at our law courts. Drugs went missing. Uh, safes went missing. Our Chief Justice of the Republic of the Gambia, his office broke government orders to go and buy a V8 vehicle for $4.2 million. When the hospital in the Gambia cannot have blood bags, cannot have surgical gloves, cannot clean their toilets, cannot unblock their toilets, cannot have bed sheets for their toilets, cannot have water for patients, cannot have electricity for patients, cannot have blood for patients. Our sisters and mothers and, and aunts are dying from simple simple. Uh, child birth. Our children are dying rampantly from poisonous medicine that's been imported to the Republic of the Gambia. Instead of ordering medicine from reputable, accredited pharmaceutical companies, we ordered medicine from a non-approved, non-accredited, not a reputable company that ended 
the lives of many children in the Republic of the Gambia. And who knows, maybe several other adults. Because in the Gambia, sometimes people buy medicine. Whether it's a child or an adult, they drink it without knowing the age limits or the dosage of that medication. From what I know, there have been several deaths from kidney and liver failures between 2018 and 2022 in the Gambia. Several. Plenty. Lots of them, young men and women, died from kidney and liver problems. Kidney and liver problems. Kidney and liver problems. And those are associated with the consumption of intoxicated medicine or the consumption of unfit water or, or food can cause serious fatal consequences to your to human beings mainly from organ failure kidneys and liver are very susceptible to the introduction of toxic or infected stuff or unfit poisonous stuff to our bloodstream, to our digestive system. They're very susceptible to it. That's the state we have. That's the current affairs in the Gambia that I came here to talk about today. But I can sit here until 7 in the morning. I will not exhaust the deplorable situation we found ourselves in on the Adam Barrow. And I've already been here for an hour discussing with you. I wanted to talk about several other topics, including what's actually happening at the National Water and Electricity Company. But I'll come back again. Like this channel, subscribe to this channel, share this channel with people. Facebook is censoring me heavily. All right, I've got a decent following in, on Facebook. But Facebook is hiding my post because the Europeans and the Americans no longer value free media and free speech. They want people who tow their line. They want people who lie. They want people who misinform and disinform people. And I'm not engaging in that sort of politics. I will never engage in misinforming and disinforming people. I don't want to engage in that. I can't see the benefit to it. I want to be able to speak to people and have solid evidence, solid backing to what I'm saying. So everything that I discuss in terms of Gambian politics publicly is something that's proven. I'm sitting on solid information. Uh, but again, the education sector, I'll come to it. All right, The medical sector, I've not even... It's a tip of the iceberg. I just spoke about one ambulance. So the COVID ambulances that they bought, about 8, 10, 12 ambulances. They're telling us that after two years, from 2021, after two years, 2021 to now, 2023, the ambulances have all broken down, done, dusted, broken down, beyond repair. Main referral hospital, you go to some hospitals, the battery in the ambulance is not working. You go to some hospitals, there's no fuel in the ambulances and patients die because of these things. It, it's, uh, it's, it's excruciating. It's absolutely gut-wrenching. It's soul-destroying to look at the Republic of the Gambia and think this was a probable nation developing rapidly maybe not as rapid as dubai maybe not as rapid as singapore maybe not as rapid as other countries but we were a probable nation going places ticking along now we're a cranking engine the gears are cranking the chances are the only reverse gear would work only the reverse gear would work we can't go forward we're just cranking. And if that reverse gear is not working properly, you know that Jahali Konko, that used to kill lots of drivers in the old days when it was so high and most of the vehicles in the Gambia didn't have good brakes or good torque to be able to climb on the hills. The vehicles used to start reversing in a, in, unintentionally and then they'll go and crash in the ditches at that Jahali Konko. That's where we are. Gambia is only relying on a reverse gear. If that reverse gear doesn't hold itself, it doesn't have traction, our vehicle, called the Gambia, is going to start reversing into that ditch. It's a car crash waiting to happen, literally. That's where we are. I don't borrow standing up. He never talks about things that are affecting Gambian people. No. He wants to talk about Hussein Dab and UDP, how the opposition will never amount to anything Quickly forgetting that he was opposition for 20 years. 
The opposition will never amount to anything. Opposition don't like the country. Opposition can never develop anything. Yeah, because the opposition is not employed. We don't have the government purse. We don't have the sovereign wealth. We gave you the sovereign wealth, Adam Abaro, to develop the Republic of the Gambia, but you're taking the sovereign wealth and giving it to Senegal. Yeah? So this is the problem we have. Yes, my brother, I lost a, few, a couple of family members from kidney and liver problems in 2020 and 2021. Right? And still, friends of friends have been dying from kidney. And it's rampant in the Gambia. It's rampant. And the dialysis unit that President Jame instituted in the Gambia that was curing patients, helping them out, filtering their kidneys, that, di that dialysis unit went, kidney unit went. They didn't repair the machines. They didn't replace them. Dead. In fact, that day from Carnifin General Hospital, one of the patients who was there under treatment, I think it was a soldier, the dialysis machine failed to work. He was supposed to be transported from there to Edward Francis Moore Teaching Hospital. The ambulance didn't have a working battery and he died. Young soldier who was sacrificing his life for the Republic of the Gambia died because the ambulance didn't have good working battery in it. How, do, how much does a battery cost? The hospital couldn't buy a battery and replace it in the ambulance. Died just like that because they couldn't take him. We used to have very good dialysis unit at General Carnifin General Hospital. All those machineries, ultrasounds, uh, CT scans, M CT MRI scanners that President Jammer bought. When they broke down or they stole them, who knows? Where are those ambulances that they bought with COVID money? Where did they go? Did they convert them to, into public transport so they can earn money from it? We need to, we, we, look, uh, it's getting too much. It's got, people don't know how much it, it actually affects me in my head. I come across as if I'm calm and relaxed about every single thing. That's my demeanor naturally. Even if you drop bombs on my left, bombs on my right, I rarely panic like the average individual. I think first before I start doing stuff. And I compose myself before I face the public. But these issues are absolutely eating me inside. Where are the ambulances that they bought with COVID money? Where did they go? COVID is no longer a problem. Why aren't the ambulances being used for transporting patients at Edward Francis Small Teaching Hospital? Did they, trans did they change them? Did they sell them to private clinics? Are the ambulances running for private clinics? Did they convert them into public transport so that they can pocket the money? What happened to the COVID ambulances? Anyway, I've been here for one hour, eight minutes, and I just wanted to dedicate one hour to this program. Uh, it's getting late. Uh, I've got an event to go to tomorrow. So, therefore, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for tuning in. I'll be doing my lives on this channel from now on uh, until Facebook removes the uh, restrictions on my channel. Uh, Facebook doesn't want us to talk about African unity, Pan-Africanism. They hate it, all right? They sanction my account because I was talking too much about Niger the junta in Niger, and how they should kick the French army out. So they sent me via their fact check, fake fact check rioters, yeah? Yeah, Reuters. They sent Reuters to come and fact check my post I wrote about uh, Burkina Faso and Niger. Two, they flagged up. One, they said, oh, the video I shared of Captain Ibrahim Traore of uh, Burkina Faso is an old video. I said, yeah, my post never said the video is new. I said, Captain Ibrahim Traore received a rapturous welcome on his return from Russia when Russia and African governments had a summit. I didn't say, look at this video of Ibrahim Traore when he came back yesterday to a rapturous welcome. I never said that. I said, Ibrahim Traore um, benefited from a rapturous uh, uh, welcome in Ouagadougou on his way back from Russia. I never said that video was that day. And then they apologized, but they've still... Reducing distribution of both my pages, Mr. Lamentamba and Lamentamba. They restricted both. They said they're not recommending my pages to anyone anymore, which means they're hiding my posts. Several people have been complaining to me last few weeks. They can't see my uh, profile. They can't see what I post anymore. I said, yeah, that's because Facebook, the cradle of democracy, 
doesn't want democracy anymore. They don't want us to talk about African unity. Pan-Africanism is a big threat to these people. Once they recognize you as a Pan-African, they start censoring you. That's what they did to our page, the United States of Africa as well. Censored it. Every time we get to 500,000 followers, we should have about over 2 million followers now on the United States of Africa since we set it up three years ago. Every time we go close to 500,000, they reduce it down to, they start defollowing uh, the page to maybe 400,000. And then we start going up again to 500 and something, 6,000, they start defollowing people again. This is the West, European and American values. They don't want us to talk the truth. They want us to sing their praises. They want us to talk about football or basketball or other things. They don't want us to talk about African unity. They don't want to talk about Africans renegotiating contracts uh, for all the raw materials, the mineral resources we supply to the world. They don't want us to renegotiate the prices so that the amount of money they're paying Canada for their uranium, Niger can have the same amount of money. So that the same amount of money they're paying India for their diamonds, they want, we want African people to have the same money for the diamonds. There cannot be a price for Russia, a price for Canada, a price, and a price for Africa. No. A diamond is a diamond. A red diamond should be a, di a red diamond price for one gram. Blue diamond, one gram. Ruby, one gram. Ivory, one gram. Whatever you pay Canada for the same gram, or you're paying China for the same gram, pay Niger the same, pay Ghana the same, pay Democratic Republic of Congo the same. They don't want to hear that. They want to have African stuff at a steal, which is why I don't like Makisal. I don't hate Makisal because of anything. I just don't like people who are French stooges. That must end. France was paying less than two euros to Niger per kg of uranium. But the same France was paying Canada $200 per kg of uranium. What, in what world is that supposed to be right? How is that supposed to be correct? That's what we're fighting. And that's why Facebook is fighting against us. So I'm likely to come here until YouTube actually finds out that there's another Pan-African on this page too. <laughs> and then they'll start taking measures there if the deep state tells them, look, Africa is getting too united. They are renegotiating their contracts. We can't afford this. Start clamping down on their Pan-Africans. As Macron said, he said the new wave of anti-French sentiment. We don't hate French people, no. It's not about individuals. It's the French foreign policy, the American foreign policy, the European foreign policy that we have issues with. Those things we want to change. So thank you very much for tuning in. I uh, appreciate you all. Uh, thank you. Uh, good night.